first uh, sort of main test is this one sample t test. So it's very <coughs> fundamental, and we know a bit about the theory. We know a bit about the SPSS of this one. So it's for a single population mean. And one of the other sort of basic standard tests is for what we call a proportion in a uh, population. So here is again a large population. Just make sure we have the sound. It's uh, fairly important. Uh, and this population has a proportion of something which we call p. So now the parameter is, the unknown parameter is p here. Um, first of all, you must not confuse this with a p-value, which we call capital P. So this is oh, somewhere between 0 and 1. It's the proportion of smokers in Finland, for instance. And of course, there can be statements, and there will often be statements about such proportions. Um, the alternative hypothesis, there will be so here is a p0. And the alternative will say, OK, p is greater than p0. It's smaller than p0, or it's a two-sided thing that's saying that it's just different from p0. And the null hypothesis typically says a particular value for p. So I'm not going to spend much time on deriving distributions and so on for this one. It's um, done in in any basic statistics course. So we're going to use as a test statistic. OK, we will, of course, observe from a sample here. So you take n, and then you observe how many have this property that you're looking for. So it's k, and k over n is what we call p hat. So. This is the estimate for, for p, of course. Um, so here is 0, and here somewhere is 1. And then you observe p hat on some side of p0. And then the question is, as always, is this a significant uh, evidence that this is true in favor of that. And the question has to be answered by looking at the test statistic. And in this case, we, we don't look at p hat itself, but we look at what I've called set up there. So you take p hat, you subtract the fixed value from here, and then just divide by by this. And then I call it set. I must do something with my aggression <laughs> level. <laughs> um, yeah. So this is the test statistic. And what it's saying here is not entirely Well, it's not entirely wrong. It's not entirely the best thing. I think in the compendium, there's a slightly different condition there. So it says n p0 times 1 minus p0 mm -hmm. greater than 5 or something in the compendium. Yeah. So these are also not 
scientific limits in a way. It's just a rule of thumb saying that we need the sample size to be somewhat large in order to use what we like to use, namely the standard normal distribution for this test statistic. And this is one of the sort of rule of thumbs. Sometimes more careful people say 10 here, but it's, it's not that important actually. Um, so just note that this says, says suppose that P0 is 0 0.5. And what is this requirement actually saying? It's saying that n is greater than, or let's say like this, n times 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 is greater than 5. That means, OK, then it says n over 4 greater than 5. It says n greater than 20. So it is uh, sort of requirement of sample size. <coughs> that we should not forget entirely. And if we have this property, we will just use the standard normal for this thing. Uh, I think we are just going to drop simply using SPSs for this test because it's not going to be important in that way for us. And the SPSS implementation of this test has some some stupid complications, I would say. So I'm just going to show you more or less the theory here, and then we can do this by hand calculation. But remember now that when I tell you this, if you think hard about it, you should be able to now derive how this whole test is going to come out. We have test statistic. We know the distribution, the null distribution. We can compute it from the sample. So it's just to observe what we get from this and compare it to this and then figure out this with the critical directions and so on. But knowing this, we are already technically finished with the test in a way. So, so to make it just precise, here is the well-known standard normal. And depending on the shape of the alternative hypothesis, the critical direction could be like this, for instance. And say you observe setups here. It's just a matter of computing the p-value again. And clearly, the critical direction for set, it comes from the critical direction in this picture. So if it's this alternative, then that would be the critical direction. You have to observe p-hat somewhere above p0, which means observing set somewhere positive. So it's exactly the same as in the t-test we saw. Yeah, so this example is more or less from the compendium also. Um, so, you have uh, visiting customers at some website, web shop, um, and this population is all the potential and existing customers who visit this shop. And the interesting parameter is now what proportion of the people who actually go into this site are buying something. And from historical data, they They have a track saying that, OK, 13% of the visitors um, would buy something. And now they have the goal, or they had the goal to improve this. And they made a new 
uh, web solution. And the question is, do we have evidence from the first testing, for instance, that this new web solution increases P? So then probably you would like to, to put up alternative hypothesis like this. So it's a one-sided alternative. Here is the um, the old value, which we call p zero. And now we want to see if <laughs> data gives evidence that p is greater than this. So immediately we see critical direction must be this way. We have to see 0 0.15 or 0 0.17 or something like that before we start even believing in this. Now it turns out that we do this sample of some n and we compute the, pro the percentage in the sample. It's 16 percent. That is p hat equal to 0 0.16. So it's here. And the sample size was 300. So let's find the p-value for this observation here. Uh, yeah, so it's just to compute the set ops. So it's just p-hat minus p0, then p0 times 1 minus p0 over 300, and the square root. And it comes out at 1.55. And the smell of this is a p-value that is not too low. So I'm drawing this picture again and again and again. It's not the normal. This is the null distribution we observe here. 1.55. And we know that this is not extremely high for a standard normal distribution. So um, yeah, just figure it out. It's going to be so p value is uh, 0 0.61, 0 0.061. So it's fairly low, but it's not really hard enough to throw away the null hypothesis because alpha is 0 0.05. So it's close, but not sufficiently strong to reject the null hypothesis at the given level. So I'm saying here no evidence, but this is uh, in the shade of gray area in a way. We are close to alpha, but not below. So there's some weak evidence, I would say, but not strong enough at least to reject. Um, This one, I don't think I want to go into this right now. It's, um, it's a binomial test. I can just show you in case you need it sometime. Because um, I had a little problem by finding this data that I was actually <laughs> looking for. Um, But 
I can just show you here in case you need it in your master thesis or something if you want to do a lot of these binomial tests with data. Um, it's of course here as most other thing and it's in what we call non-parametric tests. Um, what I sort of discuss briefly in the compendium is in what is called legacy dialogues. So these are the old versions of the menus. And here is the binomial test. But I see some trouble by using this. So if you want to do it, you should go for the new one, I guess, which is here, one sample. And I need to have some data. OK, what? Um, one sample and you just have to read a little bit about this because it's defined in some different ways than the standard tests in SPSS but um, let's see So here, this is part of some machinery that I don't know too much about. But at least in inside here, you can find compare observed binary probability to hy hypothesized, and it's a binomial test. And then you can set some options. Um, so you specify the success value which tells you, even, you know, in SPSS, such a variable, it would be uh, something like this. For the customers of this web shop, this is a buyer, this is a non-buyer. And then you would specify as a success value a buyer, and then define your test in some way. So my message is basically we are not going to do this with SPSS in this course, but you should know that it's possible. Um, and for this course, we are only going to, to do it like this. Now clearly, if you uh, if you want to do it manually or semi semi manually, you could use data like this, and you just do frequencies with SPSS. Then uh, SPSS would give you a table with saying mm, and zero point eighty four. Maybe it's giving you the percentage is 16% and 84%. But this is the crucial estimate here. So it's possible to use SPSS or yeah, to get all the ingredients that you need to compute this, this test statistic. And then you just use the standard normal. Let's have a look at this here. This is much more important regarding using SPSS. So it's what is called two sample T test. This is also something that in, in a general statistics course, I find this to be sort of a bit lengthy and technically complicated presentation. So I'm trying to um, simplify this again as much as possible. Um, 
So some of you who have read about this before might find it, or you may, might miss some detail here, but I think that detail is often just confusing. Okay. So this is now in a slightly different situation. We are comparing, say, women and men, or countries, Norway, Sweden, so you have different populations and you observe some var variable in these two populations and then you compare the means of these two. Um, so it could be the mean living age among women compared to men or whatever, anything. Um, and very frequently there's a null hypothesis saying that I mean, we are typically looking for differences, but the null hypothesis state that these are the same. And then an alternative can be for instance saying that mu y is greater than mu x or the opposite or that they are just different. Yeah. So here's just one of many examples. Um, it could be this is uh, April, this is May, um, and suppose you are interested in coming up with some statement about the mean square meter prices of, of the sold flats or houses for those two months, but you don't have access to the whole market data. Um, so then you, you look at some samples of size. They can be different sizes. You look at an X bar and a Y bar and a standard deviation for each. And The alternative hypothesis here says that the prices have increased from April to May. So it says mu x was less than mu y, but we don't know any of those parameters, so we must use sample data to test. And then we can do that, and we observe, in fact, x bar here. 19 point or 19,800 while while bar sit here at 21 or 20,100 and there are some standard deviations in these two data sets this sample size was 300 this was 200 and then what can we conclude from this well, as it says now, nothing so far. Because, I mean, if you have two populations like this, two different populations, you observe an average in the one population and an average in the other, even though the theoretical means are perfectly the same, you will always observe some differences between the, the means in the samples. So the big question is, is of course about significance. So there's a difference and it points actually in the direction of this one, but we have no idea at this point whether this is a significant or just an arbitrary uh, deviation. So 
the answer to this question has to come through a test statistic. and a corresponding null distribution. Okay. So if I can cook up something that I can observe from this sample involving these quantities in a meaningful way and si simultaneously keep track of the null distribution, I might be better off in trying to answer if this is a large or a small difference, which is the question about significance. So basically we are comparing the sample means, of course, but we cannot just look at them and say, okay, the difference is 300 and that's a lot. We have no idea if that's a lot or not. We have to compare it to other things in the sample. So basically we look at this difference, but we see it in relation to some mysterious square root here involving for instance, the variability of the two data sets and sample sizes. And then the good news, which we jump to immediately, is that if both of the sample sizes are not too small, we can actually use a T distribution. Now, there are some complications in how to compute the degrees of freedom in this case, but we don't care about it in this course. Um, we can just uh, be trusted that if nx, if both of these are greater than 30, then this will be sufficiently large so we can use a standard normal if we have to do hand calculations. Okay, so what this means is if H0 is true, We have this distribution for, for a T. Say, I say, I'm just saying close to standard normal. Let's look at the critical direction now. We are going to observe x bar and y bar and what is what the relation between them is going to sort of push us to believe h1. Well, this says that the mean of the y data is greater than the mean of the x data, so it's got to be something like this. Hmm? So we must see x bar less than y bar, meaning x bar minus y bar less than zero, meaning, and t is the division of x, x bar minus y bar over something positive, so it means t less than zero. So what I'm saying is you figure out that this is going to be the critical direction for t in this case. Okay? It's just maybe I'm going too fast, but sit down with a cup of coffee and think through it. Or t, if you like. It's better with t because we have a t distribution. <laughs> wow. If that ain't dry, I don't know. So, um, this is done, it's just to calculate the absurd value and then see the p-value using this distribution. So 
this happens here. Um, it's a bit of computation, but it's not hell. And you are about minus 8.5, and we know very well what that means. It means we are far out here. <coughs> and the p value is the probability, if this is t ops, probability of being less than that, given this distribution, it has to be something like this, which is practically zero. So this is a very, very, very solid indication of, of uh, increased prices from April to May. Okay. A bit dirty yeah, we, we can do this very quickly, so we can maybe repeat it next week, but just to be able to say I did it. Um, So this is uh, just an, ex uh, an example to show you how this two sample T is sort of structured in SPSS. Um. So these data they are uh, supposed to mean something like days inactive of the surgery for two different hospitals, I guess. And the goal for this type of surgery is to sort of keep this as low as possible. So you might want to test um, um, the sort of procedures at hospital A should give some average time to, to recovery uh, of mu A, while in the hospital B it could be different. So you can once again just to keep the things here, let's see. Mm -hmm. We can use this means function first to just check um, okay suppose x bar is for the a and y bar is for the b are these different and how much so you use means and you use the hospital as a grouping variable click ok here And we see for hospital A, it's 14.0, basically. And for group uh, B, it's about 15.1. So we're in this inevitable situation. You have, you're comparing two means. And in the sample, you see differences. But we have no idea at the moment if it's significant or not. We have no possibility to look at these numbers and say, oh, this hospital is better. They should do what they do. Because this could be just arbitrary. So we need to test. And I'm not going to be fairly quick, right? How do we do it? We go to compare means. Uh, and we look for something called independent samples. I call it two sample. T test, <laughs> but it's the same.
So what you do is you specify the variable, of course. So we are observing some variable in two groups. So there is one sort of test variable. And then there's a grouping variable, which sort of just defines what is A and B group here. And that is, of course, the hospital variable. Here. So you put this here. Um, just a detail, you have to define the groups because there could be like, for instance, five groups and you want to compare two of them. So they could be hospital C, D and E. And I just want to compare A and B. Then I need to tell SPSS. So I would put here A and B. So SPSS is not smart enough to realize that in my data there are only two groups. So I have to do this even though there are obviously th these two groups. Um, yeah, I guess that's all we need. And then basically there's a huge uh, output that I'm not going to go into detail because we're over time, but it's this output and we are, it's kind of extensive, but we're going to read the second line here. Here's a T. So this is the T statistic. It's minus 2.71. Here is the complicated degrees of freedom. It's actually uh, not even an integral in this case. And the most important number is this one, about the cigarettes, uh, or the significance. So the two-sided p-value here is now low. It's 0 0.008. So we would actually reject say mu a is this an alternative so it turns out this is in fact a quite significant difference and I'm willing to say I don't believe in that I think that the hospital a is really producing significantly lower recovery times. Okay, I think I should just um, stop there. We'll just pick up from this point next week.